So the next panel is going to be about regenerative models from soil to shelf, ag and climate solutions throughout the supply network. And I have to tell you, this is going to be really special. We have three powerhouse women here ready to be sharing insights, ideas, inspiring us, and of course, uh, answering lots of questions later in the deep dive sessions. So I would love to welcome now on stage the moderator, which is Erin Callahan. So Erin, please join us virtually on the stage. Erin is the director of the Climate Collaborative, responsible for management and execution of the collaborative's work, including all programming, communications, and outreach. And we're honored that you're with us. So Erin, the stage now is yours. And I know Carol and Katie are going to join you right now. So please take it away. Thank you for being with us and have a wonderful time. Thank you so much, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me all well. While we have Carol and Katie join us, I just want to start by saying thank you guys so much. I'm really excited to have this content covered today at Food Funded. And it's really nice to be connecting with you all virtually. I'm all for talking about climate change in any way we can these days. And related. I know it's been a hard few weeks for Californians with the wildfires, so if any of you guys have been affected, um, I'm thinking of you. Um, before I introduce Carol and Katie, which I will do momentarily, I just wanted to ground everyone a little bit in the conversation today. So I'm the director of the Climate Collaborative. We're a community of about 670 companies who are working on climate issues with the natural products industry, and we work with companies on a range of issues, but one thing that's become really clear since we launched three years ago is that regenerative agriculture is really gaining ground as an exciting solution to climate change that our industry has kind of been a pioneer on. And there is so much happening in this space. And we're going to try with Carol and Katie today to kind of decomplexify and roadmap a little bit of what's happening. But there are so many pilots running small scale, large scale, a range of approaches, certifications, data on return on investment, all becoming really clear kind of in real time. And alongside that, there's a lot of segmentation, complexity, uh, you know, there's a lot of different terms for what this even is. You know, we've got carbon farming, climate smart agriculture, regenerative agriculture, regenerative organic. So it can be really confusing. Um, they all generally refer to a similar set of practices that help pull carbon out of the air and into the soil and turn soil into a carbon sink. Um, and, you know, why is this gaining uptake right now? You know, we, we've seen Cargill and some of the world's largest companies make regenerative agriculture commitments in the last few weeks and months. And for companies of any size, but especially the large companies that are being forced to look into their supply chains, they're starting to realize that agriculture accounts for over half their emissions and starting to look toward the soil as a solution for mitigating it. But I would say that within our industry, we've been we've seen a lot of the pioneers of these practices, and you'll hear from a couple of those today, um, wherein you know we've been we've been practicing regenerative ag for decades in a lot of cases, um, and the same way that we've kind of been first movers on organic, non-GMO, biodynamic. That's certainly been the case for regenerative ag. So we have a lot of interesting test cases that have kind of served as a proof of concept. So with that, I want to move into hearing from a couple of those companies. And we're so lucky today to have Lotus Foods and Happy Family Organics. We have Katie Clark and Carol Levine today joining us. And I'd love to have the two of you introduce uh, yourselves and kind of get us started by grounding us in your climate journeys and how regenerative ag fits into that. And Carol, maybe you can get us started. Thanks, Erin. Um, you know, agricultural sustainability has been part of our DNA since Ken and I founded Lotus Foods in 1995. You know, I think our real climate journey started um, at least 15 years ago in 20, um, 2005, 2005, when we were first introduced to the system of rice intensification. Um, this was in, this is an agroecological uh, methodology for growing rice whereby smallholder farmers using 50% um, less water, 80 to 90% fewer seeds, no agrochemical inputs, um, emitting about 40% less methane gas, where these farmers can actually double and triple their, their yields and it also lessens women's labor. So, you know, 
most people don't know that rice is the staple for over half the world's population. But but they also don't know, people don't also know that global rice production consumes a quarter to one third of the planet's annual renewable supply of fresh water. So this is leading to serious depletion of watersheds. Um, and, um, and, and even irrigated rice production is a serious emitter of greenhouse gases. So just by the way we change how rice is grown, we can have economic, social, and environmental impacts. And uh, it, we feel it doesn't get better than that. And we feel so fortunate to be able to do this work. Great. And I definitely want us to dig much more deeply into more crop per drop. But Katie would love to first have you ground us in Happy Families Regenerative Journey and how it fits into your broader climate journey. Um, so for those of you that are not parents, Happy Family Organics is an organic baby food company. We were founded in 2006 um, and our mission is to change the trajectory of children's health through nutrition. And our mission is really intimately connected with um, being an organic company. We've been organic since day one, and that has really been the primary vehicle by which we accomplish our mission. Um, and for many years, we, um, as a company, felt like organic um, was the way to be a sustainable company. And over the years, we've really um, come to realize that as a company, we have a very we have a holistic supply chain, and we need to think critically about sustainability at all, at all elements across that supply chain. So. Agriculture is still a really key component of our sustainability strategy, um, but we also focus heavily on um, waste when it comes to packaging, um, as well as uh, climate more broadly, thinking specifically about carbon um, and carbon reductions. Um, so regenerative agriculture is one of the ways in which we aim to um, help accomplish our, our carbon goals. And I can get into a little bit more about what, what we mean when we say regenerative um, next. You've preempted my next question, Katie. So that kind of is, I think, I was kind of in my intro trying to get across the fact that regenerative means different things to different people. And it's being talked about, about so much right now that kind of, I think it would be helpful to ground people here and kind of what does regenerative mean to each of you? And Carol, maybe you can get us started. For, for Lotus, what does regenerative mean to, to the work that you do and to the practices that you're pushing across your own supply chains, but also promoting much more broadly than that? Well, when you know we, we saw a need to address the negative social and environmental fallouts of the Green Revolution, um, and SRI was really one of these um, one of these solutions that were was right there underneath the soil for us, and so um, we really this was a viable solution to food security and poverty alleviation, and with the increase in yields, using less inputs, and by creating a global marketplace. You know, we have really seen not only the sequestering of carbon and the building of soils. But you know, farmers' um, prosperity and livelihoods, you know, being enriched. So it's you know, I know we're going to talk about this later, but we see um, regenerative as being more holistic. It's not just about building soils. It's not just about water. It's not just about sequestering carbon. Growing rice is a total village um, enterprise. It takes the entire village and everybody in the village to play these significant roles. And, um, and for us, it's really significant for women who do most of the backbreaking work associated with growing rice. Um, you know, in particular, their health is improved because they no longer have to spend weeks slogging through flooded fields, you know, with their hands and their legs constantly immersed in muddy waters. You know, we have this uh, conical weeder that they go into a field and they 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 sit upright, you know, and they stand upright, and their posture is so much better when they're just doing simple weeding, when which you have to do when you're when you're growing rice, and um, and also they have more time for themselves. Um, this this methodology allows them to spend less time in the fields, especially during the 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 sunny days when the sun is out full and and it's so hot. 
And then all this extra time that they have, now that they can spend on their own kitchen gardens or then rearing their children's or actually even starting enterprises. So we really see regenerative as a much more holistic um, base of, of, of foundational work that just builds on all these social, economic and environmental impacts. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I, it's much beyond just the SRI or system of rice intensification um, process that you guys have developed. This is much more about working with the communities in which your supply chains operate and having all these co-benefits. I definitely do wanna dig more into that as you've just referenced, but Katie would love to hear what regenerative means for happy family. Yeah, Carol and I are um, very much in line. We also um, see regenerative and organic farming as a holistic approach to farming that empowers farmers, sequesters carbon, um, you know, protects animal welfare. It's it's about the entire ecosystem, and we we really see regenerative um, bringing forward those those ecosystem services. Um, for us, with our consumer base, we think that our consumers are most interested in. Um, messaging around helping to reverse the climate crisis and, and the potential of regenerative ag um, to sequester carbon. And so that's kind of how we lead with our messaging. But behind the scenes, we really see it as a holistic approach to, to agriculture that has many co-benefits um, for the entire community, like, like Carol said. Yeah. That's great. And I kind of want to dig into that a little bit. And you know, for both of you, it's really clear for a lot of companies deciding that you want to invest in re regenerative agriculture projects up your supply chain really means getting to know your suppliers better, getting to know your farmers better, and working really closely with them to better understand their needs, the soil's needs, and have these kind of tailored outcomes-based approaches in a lot of cases that help, you know, not only store more carbon in the soil, but ideally increase productivity, um, increase farmer profitability, all these things that really matter given where the current farming system and agriculture system is and most places globally. Um, can you kind of talk a little bit about what that journey has looked like for you? And Lotus, maybe we can start with Carol Lotus's journey on this. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about More Crop for Drop and how you guys went about developing this and how you went about building it into your supply chains. That's quite a lot to take on. What, what does that look like in terms of getting to know needs and getting, you know, supporting these transitions on the ground? So first of all, um, we didn't start um, System of Rice Intensification. System of Rice Intensification was started in the 70s by an agronomist in, um, in Madagascar during a drought where he was just through observation seeing that when the rice fields actually didn't have um, water, it actually um, did fine with, with basically doing some simple differences in um, more spacing between um, plants for better photosynthesis um, for smaller, um, younger plants. And so he created this methodology. And as I said before, it was an answer to poverty alleviation and food insecurity. Um, what we've been able to do in, 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 in the last 15 plus years is to really create the marketplace where so by we can scale this agroecological methodology that then how then actually blessedly um, sequesters carbon and um, reduces methane gas emissions. But we've seen that our farmers often talk about how much better they feel when they no longer work with toxic chemicals. Um, we've also had an abundant amount of research showing that with healthier soils under more crop or drop management, the nutrient density of the rice grains is much higher than rice grown conventionally. So these are, these are the first hand impacts that we've seen that adapting these practices truly transform the well being of, uh, of the entire village, you know, community. Um, so, you know, we, we just feel that, you know, being a, a part of the pilot for regenerative organic agriculture certification, you know, pioneered by brands like Dr. Bronner's and Patagonia and others really, um, really helps to transform our global food system. Yeah. That's great. And I definitely want to dig into some of the barriers and how we can get around those and how everyone in this kind of um, meeting can help help achieve that. But 
Um, Katie, I know Happy Family has also had a couple of pilot projects that you've run and learned a ton from. It sounds like just from having talked to you separate from this, I'd love to hear kind of, you know, how you guys approach the, the pilot that you first did a couple of years ago and what the journey has looked like since then. I think for a lot of companies, it can be quite intimidating especially if you aren't the biggest buyer of your supply chain of how do you support farmers on the ground? What do those conversations look like? How do you actually support these transitions? So could you talk a little bit about um, Happy Family's journey on that front? Yeah, so um, in 2018, we launched our first pilot program of a regenerative ag farmer training um, program. Uh, and it was really meant to be a pilot. It was very small scale. Um, and really worked closely with two farmers in our supply chain, one in Argentina and one in Michigan, um, to really just start to understand what were the issues and obstacles that they were facing on their farm um, to being productive and um, what kind of concerns they had on their farm. And also to kind of help them baseline and understand how all of their different practices were contributing to their farm carbon footprint using the Cool Farm tool. Um, and we learned a lot from that small scale pilot. We learned um, one that our marketing teams were really interested in telling the story around us working really closely with our farmers. So that really helped us to get buy-in to continue on doing more pilots in the following years. Um, but we also learned that farmers needed a lot more than just a few day engagement from us um, with, a, with uh, a regenerative ag or a soil health expert. They really needed more continuous engagement if we were going to um, support them in practice changes to, to get closer to a more regenerative model. And so that's what led us to um, where we are today, which is um, we are now working with four farms um, or small communities of farms um, through uh, working with our consultants, uh, Pure Projet. And uh, we're providing more hands-on technical support, um, as well as a regenerative farmer fund that we launched this year. So um, it's, it's not a massive fund. Um, there's $40,000 in it, and we can finance four farmers um, up to $10,000 each to support the transition of a practice they want to implement. So our focus this year was on soil health. Um, and so we have some farmers that are experimenting with different combinations of cover crops, um, we have some farmers that are um, planting trees along their um, their waterways to help preserve um, water quality and quantity um, and, and a few other projects. Um, and so it's, like I said, it's not paying entirely for all the projects that they, they want to do, but it's really helping to get farmers kind of over the hump. And it's more, it's a year long engagement with our farmers instead of just a, a week long engagement with our farmers. So they have ongoing access to um, technical support from, from Pure Projet. Yeah, that is, I love this project. And I just one follow up, Katie, you know, I know you've also talked about how farmers are also investing in these projects. So you're getting the farmers really bought in and kind of working to really invest their own kind of resources and time in making these transitions and combined with the fact that you guys are making it workable for kind of what you can do in a given year, recognizing you can't do everything. So I, I really like that approach that you guys have taken. Um, would love to just kind of hear, you know, based on the, the pilot projects that you guys are seeing, um, if you've, you know, I, you guys have kind of iterated, have this iterative process. I would love to hear kind of what that's looked like internally for you guys as you kind of charted what your regenerative journey was going to look like as a company, how you guys have been able to, you know, I think hearing about how you got the internal buy-in from marketing to be able to tell this story publicly and have it be really meaningful. Would love to just hear a little bit about whatever you can share of that kind of internal journey of how you guys have built this. I think that'd be really helpful for other companies listening. Yeah, so when I talk about like how we approach our sustainability projects, I often say that the projects that I'm working on that have marketing, um, uh, marketing potential, I often don't really need to provide an ROI on. Um, if marketing is bought in and they see that our consumers are going to be interested in hearing about these projects, then it's it's easier to experiment and uh, suggest kind of crazy things that we can just try because we think that consumers will like hearing about it. Um, if it's more kind of nitty gritty sustainability projects in our supply chain that we think consumers are not going to be that interested in, then I need to provide the business case and, and have a strong ROI. 
Um, so luckily, we've done a lot of, um, we've done some surveying of our consumers as part of what we do annually to help understand um, what our consumer priorities are. And when we ask them about a number of different sustainability projects that we're working on, sustainable agriculture is always the one that comes to the top. Um, so it's, that has been helpful to kind of justify that um, working with our farmers and telling the story of how we're working with our farmers um, is going to help our consumers be more loyal and be more interested in, in buying our products. Um, in the baby food industry specifically, there's, there's not a lot of differentiation. I think we would like to say that there is, um, and we just certainly feel like there is, but there, there are a lot of organic baby food companies out there, um, and a lot of them are telling farm stories. So um, we see our regenerative ag program as a way to help further differentiate ourselves from our from our competitors where we're working directly with our farmers and really providing that tangible support. Um, so I think that the marketing buy-in has been one of the most helpful things in getting this project to move forward um, and understanding that our, that's something that our consumers are interested in as well. That's great. That's really helpful. And I think, you know, it's kind of, I want to move into the consumer piece a little bit more, but I'd first love to just dig a little bit more into up the supply chain with farmers and ask one final question. I think to kind of frame up that question, what this conversation has made clear so far for both of you is that regenerative agriculture refers to practices within how you grow the food that you're growing up your supply chain, but also is kind of becoming part of a company ethos for how we do better um, we do more good than bad as companies um, when it comes to climate, but also for how we support um, systems level changes that are needed to kind of build communities where we operate and have a lot of co-benefits. And Carol, I think what you said earlier in the call really showed, you know, <laughs> with the SRI system of rice intensification, more crop per drop, which you guys use, um, those co-benefits are really clear. It's really clear that this is improving lives of the supply chain, especially for women. Um, it's reducing water use. It's 40% less methane. There are all these benefits that make it just a really pragmatic, holistic approach and kind of solution to climate change. Can I would love to, you know, why isn't this being used everywhere? What are the kind of structural barriers that prevent it? It seems like such a natural solution. It, and, you know, improves yields and, and profits. Um, what are the big barriers to, to having it scale more than it already is? The system itself is actually part of the problem because big ag really doesn't want this to happen. They want the farmers to be able to be beholden to them, to buying their seeds, to buying their chemicals. Um, and and it's, it's just crazy. Um, so what we love about the system of rice intensification is that it turns that totally upside down. The farmers actually are the ones who have the empowerment. Um, and so because rice is such an important player globally, it unfortunately has too much to do, you know, in the, polit in the political um, arena and with governments. And, um, and, 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 you know, we have to really think more about the farmer itself and themselves. And that's what we've been able to do is by creating markets directly for the farmers who are growing all this food they can really be empowered. And, and that's really what we need to do more of and support more of. No, it's really, I think that what you guys have both made clear in this conversation. So policy advocacy, it sounds like is a, is a piece of that. And I know there's some of that happening on the agriculture front in the US kind of supporting region ag policies. California has the healthy soils program and then programs that just support, you know, provide financial support, technical support up the supply chain are really key for companies to think through if they wanna be supporting or anyone on this call, investors, anyone who wants to support these practices, we need kind of capital and technical support. Um, I wanna move a little bit downstream in the supply chain, building on what Katie said earlier around, you know, it seems like a part of making these practices really scale is building a consumer market that demands it in the way that we've seen with organic. And I would love to get the two of your take on this. I know Carol Lotus does a great job of telling the story of more crop per drop and does it in a way that's fun and engaging. Would love to hear both of your kind of um, kind of insights on how we build a, a consumer market that really cares an, and is invested in supporting regenerative products and buying foods and maybe even paying a premium that goes back to the farmer. Yeah, you know, for us, educating consumers and the trade about rice production, rice biodiversity, better ways to grow has been something that we've been doing for a very long time, but it's not something that can be 
you know, achieved overnight. It's definitely um, persistence and just, um, you know, it's, it's part of the journey. But we're thrilled that our white and brown basmati grown by SRI farmers in India has qualified for the new regenerative organic certification, you know, at the silver level. Um, this, we decided that we wanted to be a part of the pilot um, when this started um, over a year ago was to number one, to be the voice of the smallholder farmer outside, you know, there's, there was the majority of the pilots were farm farming um, communities inside the U.S. And what goes on in the U.S. versus globally, especially in some marginalized developing countries, is very, very different, you know, around the cost of soil, um, soil um, lab testing um, in the, in, you know, when you talk about tilling um, and things like that. So we really felt it was important for us to be the voice of the smallholder farmer and, and basically how to be, because we were being a part of the standard, we got to really, you know, be an integral part of uh, how it was going to be um, put to, you know, finalized in the standards and put to everybody else. Um, the other thing for us, it was a really wonderful opportunity for us to validate um, that SRI practices are regenerative, um, which we knew they were, but now this gives us the third party certification that really helps it's to speak to um, the regenerative nature of sequestering carbon, saving water, um, you know, reducing methane gas. Um, so, um, you know, I, I just think it's a great opportunity to educate consumers and in our trade and all the necessary great work that we're all, you know, involved in doing this and also be a pioneer for the rest of the industry as well. That's great. Yeah. Well, my dog responded to what you just said. She's moving around on the couch when you started talking about consumer engagement. So, um, Katie, I know Happy Family has also um, launched a line and is trying to connect with consumers and educate and engage them. Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so uh, in February of this year, we launched um, a new line of baby food purees that um, are made with an ingredients that are what we call farm for our future. Um, so they're all ingredients from farms um, that are implementing regenerative practices. They're all baseline organic, um, but also implementing um, conservation or no-till, um, really diversified cover crops. Uh, um, some are some are incorporating livestock into their their rotation. So really, we were really looking for farmers that were going above and beyond um, the organic standard for this product line. Um, and our marketing and communications team has done a really fantastic job putting together some um, resources to educate both parents and kids um, about what regenerative agriculture means. Um, so they uh, our team developed a, a short little. Uh, video that um, uh, takes takes kids through a day in the life on the farm um, and all the different players that are important on a farm. Um, and this, we, we developed a storybook as well that uh, similarly takes kids through the different components of a farm um, and how you how you have a regenerative and, and organic farm um, and what are all the different practices within regenerative. Um, and we uh, actually had Nick Carter read the storybook to his uh, to his son on Instagram Live. So, for those of you that are uh, millennials, you can that resonates with you probably. Um, and so, I think I think our marketing team did a really fantastic job of translating something um, the topic of regenerative agriculture that can get very technical um, to something that is really easily digestible for parents and for kids. Um, to kind of, to talk about within their families of you know what are farming practices that are good for the planet, um, and how do we support for foods that are that are grown using those practices. So that's been our approach this year, and we're we're looking forward to expanding that next year. I really like the video. It's got a little cartoon piece of dirt that helps explain why we need to care about dirt. And I think that the more both of you guys, Lotus and Happy Family, have done great jobs at making it accessible, fun, and kind of bring people along on the journey with you to decomplexify. And it just feels like that's going to be really important to keep doing is because regenerative agriculture isn't really widely known now. I mean, it's some people fall asleep by the time they get to the end of saying it. It's very confusing as a term. So how do we make people care about soil? So that's really good to get both of your opinions on 
Um, I, we just have a few minutes left. I wanted to touch on, you know, this has been a crazy year to be carrying out any sort of supply chain project. Um, you know, in some cases, companies' plans have been accelerated or slowed down. Um, you know, with the global pandemic, with both of you guys being at the forefront of just keeping food supply chains running, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, has this year had an impact on any of the regenerative work that you guys have been doing? Are you full steam ahead? Are there kind of challenges you've encountered that you're getting around? Would love to just hear what that looks like. Yeah, um, first of all, apologies. We are having a, um, a huge storm right now that just came up and crept up behind us and with huge um, win. So it, it's a little disconcerting that's taking my attention away. But to me, that's all about, about your question. I mean, the pandemic is part of the, our global crisis. So yes, um, we have to think about climate justice, you know, when we think about our business and our strategic planning during this, these uncertain periods, you know, we've been, um, Lotus Foods have actually seen an increase in business um, during this time due to the rice being a staple pantry food. Um, so we've actually accelerated our projects with all our supply chain, which has had great impact in that it has increased SRI production, which means more organic and fair trade premiums, um, which is an additional safety net for our farming families, but also sequestering more carbon and, and um, alleviating some of the methane emissions. So, um, you know, we really feel that, you know, it's giving um, more consumers an opportunity to try our nutritious grains and to learn about our impacts. So um, we're taking care, we're taking advantage of the opportunity. Great. And I'm sorry that climate change is getting in the way of talking about climate change <laughs> where you are. I'm glad you're surviving. Katie, um, I know we just, I have two minutes. Okay. I've got two minutes. Um, Katie, I want to ask one final question to both of you. So if we could just hear quickly from your end, you know, what's this year's impact been? Yeah, so luckily uh, we had already planned for our project greenhouse operations this year to be relatively digital. Um, we had four farmers apply still. We were hoping to be able to kind of select from a broader group, but we still had four farmers apply. So we, we we're able to fill all of the spots for our for our fund, and we're still working with all four of them. Three of them digitally. One of them is in Europe, um, and they where they have a little bit more flexibility of movement, and so they're planning a um, socially distanced, safe farm visit uh, for next week, actually, to the farm in Italy. So we've been full steam ahead as well. That's really heartening to hear how people are adapting. The last question that I want to squeeze in for both of you is just quickly for everyone in this virtual room, everyone listening. What do they need to know? What do they need to be doing? How can they be supporting these transitions? If you each have a sentence uh, you can give on that, would love to close with that. Carol, if you wanna get us started. Um, just to really, um, to pay attention to, um, to what you're buying and what you're doing and, and, and to be part of the solution. Um, everybody can do that. And um, whether it be recycling or, you know, having a kitchen garden, there's just so much um, positive that one can do just individually. Yeah. Katie? I'm going to say policy. Policy, yeah. policy, policy. There's Maybe um, a vote. lot of... <laughs> and yeah. vote. Definitely vote. Um, but but if you're interested in the, the regenerative ag, carbon farming, carbon sequestration space, there's a lot of bills that come up um, to help support um, farmers and incentivize them to make these transitions. So pay attention to those and, and support them when you can. Yeah. And work together. Don't try to do everything alone. We can all get so much farther if we collaborate. And the collaboration that we have through the collaborative has just been so heartening to see this build and build and build. So um, hopefully we can all keep having these types of conversations together. Thank you both so much for today. This has been lovely chatting with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Carol, Katie, Aaron. Again, deep gratitude. This was incredible content. Oh, my goodness.